Well, I first heard about EFT from some other people that were practitioners and people that were counselors and trainers and um, telling me how valuable and useful it was. I had been doing something called the five minute phobia cure that uh, Roger Callahan had invented and, and I would, but I'd only been using it for phobias and then when EFT came along it became clear that you could use the technology for dealing with negative beliefs, dealing with uh, emotions that were unwanted and for me it was, um, as, as I got into law of attraction more and started realizing that in order to attract you needed to be in a space of love, joy, abundance and um, you know forgiveness and so that you're in a high vibrational place because we attract to us things that are resonating at the same harmonic that I wanted a technology that would help people release any negativity as fast as possible and so I was looking really actively for uh, those and found a number of things but I think EFT has been the most easily teachable and applicable for the general public of anything I've discovered. Well, probably the greatest kind of turning point for me is a man named Martin Leschkolnik who lives in Austria. He's a, a practitioner of EFT and he took one of my public seminars and we were doing work on uh, releasing negativity and anger and fear and things from the past and he came up to me on the break and said, you know, there's an easier way to do this <laughs> and, uh, and you can do it with more people quicker and it doesn't require all the cathartic release work that I was doing at the time. And so I said, great, why don't you come to my room and show me tonight? Because I didn't want to put him up on the stage without having seen it. And he worked with several issues of my want to believe and one the, wanting the desire to lose more weight, but I wasn't. And um, so we started tapping and all of a sudden I felt totally different inside. I mean, there was a, literally a palpable, perceptual, sensory shift about how I was feeling. And so I asked him to, uh, the next day, do some work with the group. And he does it so lightly and so with so much humor. I mean, you know, when you first learn a technique, you're trying to do it perfectly. And uh, he was just having, we were all laughing at ourselves by the end of it and just uh, so much release occurred, so many things uh, people let go. Well, every time we want to go to a place better than where we are, there are blocks inside that have stopped us or we'd already be there. And these blocks, most often, in my experience, I won't say always, but probably very close to always, seem to come from where I had an experience that I didn't complete. So basically, energy is supposed to flow through us as a waveform. You know, it just comes in. The word emotion, energy in motion. And so we say we're, we're emotionally moved by something. So when I allow myself to be moved and feel what it is and let it pass through me, then there's no blockages. But let's say my dog dies and my father says to me, you know, come on son, stop crying, be a man. Well, this crying, this releasing, this grieving that was natural got blocked. And when it, to block it, I have to shut down and I have to tighten up against it. That's why people that are uptight literally have a lot of um, emotion they haven't shared. They're, they've tightened up not to feel it because it means they're going to be get in trouble, they'll be rejected by their parents or whatever. So literally as we begin to open up to new possibilities and want to go further, these things that have been incomplete in our life come up to the surface to be dealt with, you know, or to hold us back because it's trying to protect us. And so we have to release those or we'll stay stuck. Well, if you want to create a better future for yourself and have more abundance, prosperity, and health, if you're holding on to resentments and to anger uh, and blame, you know, what happens is that you're creating a low vibration. You're literally living in the past for one thing. You're focusing. I, I do this demonstration in my seminar where I, I walk off the stage that way. So I'm walking into the future, but I'm looking at the past. I can't see the future very well. I bump into things on purpose, you know. But the idea is I want all of my attention focused on that which I want to create. I want to be fully present in the moment, but with my intention on what is my creating here and also in the future. So if I'm holding on to resentment, and anger towards someone in the past for what they did or didn't do, or even guilt for myself, which is a form of resentment turned toward yourself um, based on my expectations that you or I should have been different than I was, then what happens is I'm not focusing on my positive outcomes. And literally, we can only think about one thing at a time. So 
basically, the, the way I demonstrate it is that, like, if I take this book here, if I'm holding this book, then what happens is someone comes to give me something, I can't take it because my hands are already full. So I need to let go of whatever it is, release literally what I've been holding on to and let it go so that I have a capacity to receive that which is wanting to come into my life, that which I've preferred and desired and intended and set goals around and so forth. So when I forgive someone and literally let them go, then I'm more present. So too many people are walking around, you know, with their hands full of what you should have done and what, I, what you didn't do. And it was, in my own life, it was very important. I, I grew up with an alcoholic mother and a workaholic father who also drank quite a bit. And, um, and it took me years in the old methodologies of letting go of that. And now we have more of these, you know, fast working with the energy systems, ways to release things. Um, you know, I've used it on myself, used it with my family. My uh, wife, her father committed suicide when she was eight. And she, when I met her, she was still holding on to that very tremendously. And, um, and now she's been able to release all that. And then the natural aliveness comes forward because we're like trying to shake reality to be what we want it to be, you know, or it, it can't change the past. So by releasing the past, then I'm here and then I can be with whatever's present and create what I want. If I were teaching EFT to someone and they said, I don't want to focus on my fear because of the law of attraction, which means I'll attract them more, I say, look, here's the deal. You are unconsciously focusing on your fear all the time. It's your subconscious that needs to get reprogrammed in a sense. And so by focusing on it for a little bit of time, we can get rid of it so it's not unconsciously running you. I mean, I, I have a slide of an iceberg. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's about this much above the water, and then there's this huge thing below the water. I say, this is how your mind works. It's one-sixth conscious and five-sixth subconscious. And it's your subconscious mind that's sabotaging you. And so if we want to be more successful, we need to remove or reprogram, delete, however you erase, you know, whatever you want, the programming from the hard drive. And so basically, here's a technology that can do that. And so it's okay to focus on it for a few minutes because it's going to be gone forever makes much more sense. If you see a lot of people have mis, in my mind, misinterpreted law of attraction to say that I don't want to ever focus on reality. So my belief is you have to acknowledge reality and then choose what you want and then you have, there's a release process. Like if you look at the secret, we talk about ask, believe, receive. So I know that I want to be able to stand up on the stage and speak comfortably and be able to enroll lots of people into my company, my network, my sales presentation at the time, whatever it might be. Um, and then I have to release it and believe that it's possible. And if I only are working on the conscious level, not dealing with my unconscious beliefs that can sabotage me, all the intention in the world isn't going to get me where I want to go. I'll, I'll constantly trip up. I'll get myself in trouble. And then the final part is to receive, and that's to create a vibrational match for that which you want in your life. If I'm walking around and every time I see someone that is a man and I get scared because, let's say, my father sexually abused me as a child, then I can't stay in that high vibrational state. So you have to not be in denial, but at the same time, you don't get stuck there. It's a, it's a kind of a foot in both worlds, if you will. In my experience, the way you look at your life and figure out what your beliefs are is to look at what you currently have in your reality. In other words, if I'm poor, I, have, I obviously have some beliefs about money. They could be, you know, everything from money's not spiritual, or people with money are evil. I mean, if you look at all the movies we watch, it's always the, being, the, the mean rich people who are screwing over the nice poor people. And um, so we're almost programmed that, you know, having money is a bad thing. Uh, but anyway, to, to look at all of your life and say, okay, what beliefs do I have to be holding? You know, I'm, I'm, men are bad, they only want one thing, there's not enough people to go around, you know, the, the bosses are just trying to use me, you know, whatever it might be. Now, so the first thing for me is to look at just what is my current reality. Second thing is to, I, I teach people, get together with a group of friends and brainstorm, what are the things your parents said to you growing up that you think are still limiting you? If you get five or six people together and do that, and people start thinking things like, well, eat all the food on your plate, the kids in China are starving, then you go, 
And I, today, if I go to a salad bar and I take a lot of food, even if I'm full, I keep eating it because I don't want the children in China to starve, you know, whatever. Uh, so that brainstorming technique, you can come out with a lot of things. You know, children should be seen and not heard. You're, you'll never amount to anything. You know, your father was a drunk, so you'll be a drunk too. And, um, you know, no women in this family have ever gone to college and what makes you think you can. And you've got to hide your feelings. And don't air your dirty laundry in public. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff we got. I think the most common blocks people have to having more money in their life is they don't believe they deserve it. There's, um, you know, we, we know that, for example, 38% of all women in the state of California have been sexually abused or raped by the time they're 38, and uh, I mean, yeah, by the time they're 18, rather. And so what happens is that when I was doing my self-esteem seminars for years, people would come in and they really felt like they didn't deserve to be wealthy. There was something wrong with them. They were damaged goods. I remember doing a seminar for a Benedictine Abbey down in Florida. And uh, many of the monks there were there out of guilt, not out of a desire to be closer to God. One guy had taken an entire troop up the Rhine River during World War II. Everyone was killed but him, and he was the leader. So he came back, went on about a three-week drunk, and then basically joined the monastery. And I said, so why did you join? He said, because I didn't believe I deserved to have any more pleasure in my life. I did to be kind of abrogate that. And so this sense of unworthiness is a big issue for people. I think there's a fear of being corrupted, becoming evil. There's deep subconscious programming that money is bad, you know. Filthy lucre, you heard that term. Don't put the money in your mouth. It's got germs on it. It's dirty, you know. Uh, people with money get corrupted. And certainly we've seen examples of that. But we've seen other examples, you know, where they get the money and they're not corrupted. So money is obviously not the variable. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid. They've seen, they're, they're afraid of rejection if they get money. You know, they grow up in a family and they see that they're not poor, they're not rich, and the next door neighbor is. And they start resenting the neighbor for having stuff they don't have. And then as they grow older, they go subconsciously, I don't want to be resented, you know? And then I, I grew up, when I was in college, I had room, uh, not roommates, but friends with names like Larry Rockefeller, Max Factor III, you know, and so forth. And these were all people that were extremely rich. And whenever you'd introduce them to somebody, they'd say, never say my last name. You know, hi, I'd like you to meet my friend Larry. Hi, I'd like you to meet my friend Max. Why? Because they were afraid people would only like them for their money. You know, I remember back in the 70s when there was an organization started for people who were inherited wealthy. And they were all running around in Birkenstocks and driving old Volkswagen Beetles, you know, and so forth. And no one knew they were wealthy. And, and they didn't want anyone to know they were wealthy. In fact, one guy had literally millions and millions of dollars, and he would borrow money from his friends because he didn't want them to resent him, re reject him. He felt guilty for having all this money. Like, how come I do? I know when I first made $6 million in one year, when the chicken soup books really took off, I went through what I call my nouveau riche stage, and I bought lots of stuff, and I had a lot of fun doing it, but I felt guilty. It took me about three years to come to the place where I felt comfortable having that much money in my life, and there's a transition. So and it's harder, I think, when you get it all at once. So you've got all these people that have all of these beliefs about money so that when money starts to come into their life, they will actually sabotage themselves to put themselves back to that level where they feel comfortable again. Some people don't want to be responsible for that much money. They don't quite know what criteria would I use for spending it, investing it, giving it to philanthropy, and so on and so forth. So rather than deal with that, they'll just deny it or lose it. We see all the people that win lotteries. I mean, there's research on this. Um, something like 90% of the people that win a lottery within three years are back to the same economic level. They've either given it away, gambled it away, spent it all away, because their self-image wasn't one of being wealthy. So they had an impoverished image of themselves, because that's the way they grew up. So lots and lots of um, pain around money. I remember teaching a workshop on abundance in Australia, and this woman in the middle of it just started screaming, money, money, it's terrible. I can't believe you just case so much pain. And she talked about her father, and he, all he did was work for money. He was never there. Money was all that mattered to him. And so she blamed money for the fact that she didn't get the love she needed from her father, and the divorce it created, and then the, the fight over the will and all this stuff. And so she didn't want that. She wanted simplicity and love. And she thought the money was the cause of it when it wasn't.
the only advice I would have for someone who's thinking about EFT would be do it. I mean, there's nothing to lose. It's so fast. It's such a powerfully quick process, and you can do it on your own. It's not something you have to have someone else do to you. One thing I've loved about EFT is that there's kind of a, I call it a populist approach. Let's, let's kind of take this technology and give it away. I mean, you can go on a website and get protocols for the techniques and the tapping points and the sequence and the nine gamma points and all that stuff. And it's, uh, it's, it's easily learnable and doable. I mean, I've taught it to, um, to nurses who have to put people into, um, you know, CAT scan machines who are phobic and within like a few minutes, in they go, no big deal. So it's fast, it's rapid, it's effective, and um, you know, there's, there's, there's no um, toxic side effects, you know, it's just perfect. What I see 10 years from now is that every kid in school will be knowing this stuff. I mean, you know, the fact is we have some incredible technology that's available now in terms of, you know, psychological techniques that we're all using, like EFT. And it's all, it's spreading so fast. I think this will be standard, you know, kind of like, you know, if you get the hiccups and someone goes, boo, you know, because, like, you know, if you scare yourself, you, your hiccups go away. Uh, I think it's going to be as common knowledge as that, you know, it, it, it's, the internet has changed everything. And with television now, with internet TV and streaming videos and, and all of that, um, anything that is good spreads virally. And the viral spread of this is phenomenal. I mean, literally, when I've got people coming up to me in my workshops and saying, do you use EFT? And so, of course, you know, oh good. And it's, so it, it, it's out there, and I think that 10 years from now, uh, what we've learned in the secret law of attraction will be as, as commonly understood as the law of gravity, and that EFT and other technologies that are still to be evolved. I mean, you know, EFT is, and I'm only looking at it from the periphery, um, has gone through several stages of evolution, and new technologies and new applications keep being created by people who are experimenting and so on and so forth. So um, one of my friends is a... Tai, uh, tai Chi and Qigong master, Chun Yi Lin. And his dream is to have a healer in every family, like a doctor in every family. He teaches how to heal with energy. And I believe that we will have that, that, that this is just going to become common knowledge, like, you know, Neosporin and a Band-Aid. And uh, we'll have that same um, understanding about how the mind and the emotions work. You know, a number of years ago, I was in Bangkok, Thailand, and as you do when you're a tourist, you travel around and see all the little sites, and there's three places you always go. There's the reclining Buddha, which is this gold leaf, the Buddha that's about as long as a football field, and then you go to this jade Buddha, which is about this tall, solid jade, and then you go see this thing called the golden Buddha. The golden Buddha is about ten and a half feet tall, of solid gold, and it's an amazing thing when you see it. It's just, it's, it's huge. So while I was looking at the, the golden Buddha, my wife was off to the right side, and I was taking a picture and she was over, there was this case that was full of a piece, big piece of clay about a foot thick, two feet wide, three feet tall. And it said in 1953, four, five, six, seven, something like that, that they didn't know there was such a thing as a golden Buddha. And they were actually lifting this big clay Buddha to move it, to make way for a road that was coming through. And as they lifted it up in this temple, it, it cracked. And they put it back down and uh, it was, by then it was outside and it would start to rain. And so they put a big piece of canvas over it to keep it dry. And the head monk that night came out to see if it was staying dry, and he shined a flashlight underneath the canvas tarp they'd put over it. And something reflected back from inside the crack, and he said, well, clay doesn't reflect light. There must be something else in there. So the next day, in the back where it wouldn't show if they screwed up, they chipped away, and sure enough, there was this golden Buddha inside. And their, their best theory is that about 300 years earlier, the Burmese were attacking Thailand. And the monks in this monastery covered up the Buddha with clay to keep it protected so it wouldn't be melted down and stolen as a spoil of war. They also think that all the monks were massacred, and therefore the secret died with the monks. So here it was like 300 years earlier or later, whatever, and they opened it up and discovered, the, I love the word discover, you take the cover off, you discover something, and the Buddha was always there. And so I was having dinner with my wife that night, and she said, you know, that golden Buddha is like the people we work with in our workshops. Every one of them has this golden essence inside, you know, Christ consciousness, 
universal consciousness, high self, love, Atman, or all these different terms that religions use. But it's been covered over with the clay of self-doubt, negative limiting beliefs and fears and so forth. And so our job in life is to remove that which is in us, to get rid of the clay, allow ourselves to get back in touch with the essence of who we are, which is divine and creative and beautiful. So I see EFT as a technology or a set of technologies that allows people to remove the clay off the golden Buddha of who they really are and let their true magnificence come forward and express itself again.